All right, so I'm, I have started recording, so this is kind of interesting. Um, so Sam Altman may be mulling to return to the company. That's from yesterday. Seven hours ago, Microsoft hires Sam Altman three days after OpenAI fired him as CEO. And then one hour ago, OpenAI staff demand board resigned over Sam Altman sacking which means they want him back. The staff wants him back. They want to get rid of the board. <clears throat> so this is getting rather interesting. <laughs> it's only over three days, okay? <clears throat> anyway, I'm not sure how many of you are following the, the, all the AI stuff, you know, but this is, you know, is kind of interesting. Yep. It's interesting because you know how you know quickly things can change, and what appears to be a, a thriving company would fire its CEO, and you know and the reason why he got fired or you know he got sacked is not explained well by any one of these articles. Um, he was lying to the board, and but the staff likes him, so they wanted they they want the board to resign. So ultimately, you know, I think it's a battle between. Okay, there it's a it's a three-ended, you know, three-front war. One is um, the board, the board of directors. The second one would be the stockholders, and of course, the third one is you know, uh, Altman himself. And uh, and Microsoft picked him up right away. It's like, okay, you can lie to your board, but we'll hire you anyway. <laughs> so. But getting to you, you know, how does it, how does any of this relate to you? I've been thinking about this for a while, but <laughs> um, you can afford to lie when you're a CEO of a really, really you know, thriving company. Yep. And when do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, and and related to this, okay, look this up. Meta, um, responsible AI. So Facebook parent, you know, Meta breaks up its responsible AI team. What is that going to tell you? What is that telling you? It's all re irresponsible now, right? You know, because the irresponsible, the responsible part is broken up. It's like it's all going to be re irresponsible at this point. What what is that going to do to you? I mean, you know, you guys are looking at me and go like, this does not, this has nothing to do with me. How many of you think you can out-program ChatGPT? Mm -mm. Okay. Oh. Okay. I will. I will later. Okay, but. Um, but by the time you graduate from a four-year university, how many months would have passed from here, from this moment? 24 months-ish, okay? So it's more than 18 months, and 18 months is one period in Moore's Law, which means everything is going to double. Your, pro, your uh, processing capacity, uh, storage, network speed, they're all going to double. Okay, by the you know, before you get your bachelor's degree, which means Chat GPT 5.0 is about to be released. Okay, so they're already staging the release of 5.0, and 3.5 was, was released about this time last year. So you can kind of anticipate you know, what you know, version of GPT is or Chat GPT or a comparable product is going to be released by the time you get your bachelor's degree. 
So I think it's going to be you should you should keep an eye on you know this kind of technology like what type what is what is the capability of ChatGPT to write code? Now, does it really understand logic? The answer is no. It actually does not. Um, but it can still do things that would fascinate people. Um, it can still write program. You can ask you know, ChatGPT to write Python code. You can describe what the program is supposed to do. For certain things, it can do it. Okay. So that's something that you should probably keep an eye on for your own benefit, because you know when you graduate. Uh, from a four-year university, you still need to go find a job. Yep. I am not sure. This part is. Oh, I am recording. Okay. So those are questions that you kind of need to re-examine. You know, once in a while. Okay, because you know this is where the technology. This is where things are heading. Uh, the first kind of jobs that will be impacted by AI are the intellectual kind of job. Hmm. Not only white collar, but the kind of job, the high paying intellectual kind of job, because those are the highest paying jobs. So when people, when companies look for uh, people to let go, they're not going to target the people who are making, you know, not a whole lot of money. They target the highest paying you know, people first, because, you know, that way they, they, they regain, you know, they, all that money goes into profit again. Outsourcing does not work. You know, so companies have already found out that it, that does not work. So, <clears throat> so I, I would definitely you know challenge you to you know, you challenge you to challenge OpenAI or ChatGPT to write some of the programs and see and compare your program versus you know Open uh, ChatGPT's version. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm, the description, right? I got a bunch of different, uh, <laughs> like, programming, like, the, the way the syntax is laid out. But what I thought was funny is that it didn't take into account of any type of communication. So it would, it would just spit out, like, hey, one, 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 one is a valid ticket when that's not at all what the assignment is looking for. Mm -hmm. And it would, Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, it has to do with um, the the data that we use to train um, Chat GPT. So, because you know, behind Chat GPT is a neural network. And neural networks are notorious of, you know, how many samples you need to actually train it to recognize a pattern. So if this homework assignment has been assigned by all of the other universities and the solution has been discussed, you know, online, you know, documented in documents like that, then it would probably be able to give you a good answer, a good solution. But because it is not one of the more commonly done thing, so ChatGPT does not have anything to really fall back on. So because chat GPT is a LLM, it's a large language model. So what it does is it is trained on text information that you can basically gather on the entire internet. It's recognizing patterns. It's recognizing, oh, this word tends to follow that word. This sentence or this structure of sentence will follow that structure of sentence. So everything that chat GPT does has to do with patterns. It's recognizing patterns. But it doesn't actually understand logic. I know it is kind of ironic you know, that the computer system does not understand logic because it is a neural network. So everything is based on the training sample. So that means you know, certain things it can do really well and other things it cannot do because it has no exposure to those particular problems. So it has nothing to draw from in order to formulate an answer to you. <clears throat> so it is not true intelligence by a long shot. But at the same time, you know, when when you ask it to do certain things, you know, that people expect, you know, four-year universities to be able to do, it can actually do it because you know there has been enough literature online for ChatGPT to figure out the pattern. So 
Understanding the limitations of you know, an AI engine like that, and most of the other LLMs are similar in terms of you know, the mechanism, it's going to help you because you can then focus on you know, things that you know you can do better than the AI. Yep. Mm -hmm. Between critical thinking? Well, ChatGPT does not have critical thinking skills. Zero. Huh? What makes it critical So you want to define critical thinking, right? Okay. Well, let's ask ChatGPT to define that, right? <laughs> okay, so we will just ask Google instead. Define critical thinking. I know what it is, but I want to show you what, how it's defined. The, the objective analysis and evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. So it has to do with, now what they did not mention is also the rigor involved in the analysis. In other words, you question everything, which is also one thing that I've been trying to get you guys to do is question what I say, okay? When I give you a statement, if I give you something like, oh, this, operator is really the same thing as that expression you have to think like is that really the case tech you know you know or you have to ask yourself at least can i show can i prove to myself that these two are equivalent okay so it's basically questioning everything and also you know be logical about the whole thing so this is not about being oppositional okay even though sometimes it can be misinterpreted as such but it's about you know logically questioning everything and ask do I understand it? Does it make sense to me? And so on. Oh, I... Yep. And it's something that you know, uh, chat GPT cannot do because it really has no understanding of logic itself. Does not have what? Innate freedom. I'm not sure it has to do with freedom, but it has to do with re-examining things. It just doesn't have that in its mechanism. It, it, the mechanism simply does not have any way to do critical thinking. And it also does not understand logic. So if you ask it certain types of logical problems, it can give you most of the time the correct answer, but very occasionally it will give you the wrong answer. So anyway, <clears throat> something for you guys to think about. All right. So getting back to this class, we got something that's interesting today. Um, the homework assignment of A-star algorithm is due next Monday. So um, it's a very similar, similar nature to the Dijkstra's algorithm. I give you the graph, I give you the edges, I give you the heuristic function, and then you have to give me a trace you know, based on the spreadsheet that we talked about last time. So same kind of format, you know, it's, you, it's just that you have to kind of work this spreadsheet out, just like you have to work out the Dijkstra's algorithm spreadsheet. So, um, so basically, I'm just making sure that you guys study the algorithms and be able to understand it and be able to follow it, because that's going to be on the, in the scope of the final exam. Okay, so I, are there any questions about the A-star algorithm homework assignment? So you have one week to work on it, which also means if you start on it early, you know, and you have any questions, we can I can answer those questions on Wednesday. Thursday is the uh, is a holiday. Friday is a holiday as well, but Wednesday is not a holiday. <clears throat> All right, so that's that. So we are basically done with the graph algorithms. So we are now moving on to something that also relates to AI. But it's basically the extreme opposite of chat GPT type of AI. So we are moving on to predicate calculus. And predicate calculus is interesting because a, an entire programming language was invented in order to make use of predicate calculus. So this is basically AI in the 80s. Okay, so AI in the 80s is about symbolic AI. It's about, you know, um, solving problems in a logical way, which is the exact opposite of what we are dealing with now. We have tons of processing power, but yet we are going for something that is not intrinsically logical. <clears throat> so the best way to illustrate um, 
predicate calculus is to, is to show you programs written in Prolog. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at Prolog programs. To be more specific, we're looking at SWI Prolog, and it has a web you know, type of application. So that way you don't have to install anything to make use of it. So Prolog Web Surface. Okay, I cannot remember the web page to it. And we can get to... Um, there we go. Swish, 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 swish. There we go. Okay. All right. So we are going to create a program, and the program written in Prolog. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yep, that's Prolog, which is based on predicate calculus. Okay, so instead of boring you guys with all the <clears throat> uh, basics, you know, the mathematical symbols and whatnot, this is a whole lot more fun. Um, so there are a few programs that I usually use you know, to demonstrate these things. So I'm just going to use um, the, the Jedi examples. Okay, so you heard right, you know, Jedi's. Um, okay, let's get rid of that. All right. All right, so the syntax of Prolog. This is what we call a statement in Prolog, but this is also a fact. So Prolog is case sensitive. The name of a predicate has to start with a lowercase. The name of an atom also has to start with a lowercase. So an atom is basically something that exists in the universe of this particular program. It is just a thing, okay? It's, to you, it's just an identifier, okay? It has no intrinsic meaning by itself. So Luke Skywalker is really just a particular thing that exists in the universe of this program. So by combining these, okay, by saying is a Jedi, which is the name of the predicate, and then in parentheses, you know, Luke Skywalker, this is now considered a fact, okay, that Luke Skywalker is a, is a Jedi. All right, so it is a fact. Okay, now let's let's see what we can do with the fact in uh, in um, in prologue. So let me see. Where is my prologue screen window? Where's my swoosh? There we go. Okay, so I need to move this a little bit back so I don't have to go all the way <coughs> to the end of the tabs to switch back and forth. So now I can say, you know, uh, is a Jedi. The name of the predicate is up to you as long as it starts with a lowercase, it is okay. So now I specified your know, Luke Skywalker as the name of the atom, which is an element in the universe of this particular program. And then the period ends a sentence, okay? So that's basically a sentence which spells out a fact in this case that Luke Skywalker is in fact a Jedi. So with only one little thing like this, I can make a query already. So in here, you can type in a query. So Prolog is supposed to be interactive. You can make changes here and then you can change that. You can, you can make a query you, or you can use the same program and then make multiple queries about different things. So I can now ask a question, is a Jedi and then instead of using a lowercase thing, I can now use an uppercase thing like an X. So everything that is uppercase is a variable. So in this case, uppercase X is an unbounded uh, variable, which is basically I'm asking the prolog engine and say, tell me every Jedi. You know, I'm basically saying, who can substitute this placeholder X and still make the predicate true? Okay, so I'm asking a question, even though it does not look like a question, this is a question. <clears throat> so the way you run this is you either click the run, or I think it's control enter. Yep, there we go. So it gives me an answer that Luke Skywalker can be used to substitute the variable x, and that will make this predicate true. Are we good? Are we okay so far? So obviously this is a rather 
you know, silly little experiment because we only got one Jedi in the entire universe here. Of course, it knows which one is the is the Jedi. So we can ask, we can add another fact here. So um, Obi Wan is a Jedi. So Obi, how do you spell Obi Wan? I think that's I think that's it. So Obi Wan Kenobi, but I don't want it to be too long. So Obi Wan is sufficient. So now I change the program and I make the same query. Okay, Control Enter runs the query. So now it says, okay, there's a next now. There's a next button, which means Luke Skywalker is not the only atom in this universe that can make is a Jedi true, because guess what? Obi-Wan is also a Jedi. So it means you know, we can ask different types of questions. Now you can also ask a question by spelling out the name of the atom, like Obi-Wan here. And they will tell you it is true that Obi-Wan is, in fact, a Jedi. You can change it to someone else. Okay, you can change it to Sidious and ask it that question, and it will say false. So anything that is not confirmed is false. So if I don't have a confirmation that somebody is indeed a Jedi, then it will come back as a false. So that means you know, there may be Jedi in the universe that you know of, the Star Wars universe, but it's not stated here then it will still come back as a false because there's no confirmation that that particular atom is a Jedi. Is that okay? So just to give you an example, Windu. It doesn't know Windu is a, is a Jedi because it is not spelled out here. So do we have any questions about what we are talking about here? Yep. Why is this useful? Because as you add more of these facts and then you add rules, then you can ask a rule and ask your know, very interesting questions. I'll give you an example because I think you might get it as a, as a homework assignment. So let's say you enter your family tree into prologue. Okay? So the way you enter your family tree into prologue is you can state you know, who is the father of whom or who is a parent of whom and then you can also enter the gender of the person. So this, you, this way you're, enc you're encoding you know, the uh, motherhood and fatherhood uh, between the, the, the relatives, right? Then you can ask, show me all the cousins, okay? But you can also refine what a cousin is because you can say, you know, a fourth cousin, you know, twice removed. And it will find all the fourth cousin twice removed, you know, according to your family tree. Is that okay? So that's just a very simple example of why it can be useful because you know, once you have the facts, once you have the rules, then it knows how to apply the rules to tell you whether something is true or not within that universe, within the rule set of that universe. Yeah, okay, you go ahead and then you go, go ahead first. Yep, you first. This is like a propositional logic engine on steroids. This is basically, you know, this is, remember, propositional logic is called first order logic. Guess what this one is? That's right. Because it can handle quantifiers, whereas propositional logic cannot handle quantifiers. Yep. Mm -hmm. You mean proving theorems? Yes, it can. In fact, this is proving theorem right here. Is a Jedi Obi-Wan is a theorem. And it comes back and say, yes, it is. It is a fact implied by what is given to be true. Now, in this case, it's trivial because we stated the fact as it is, right? But you can ask it some other questions. As we enter more rules, you will see how this is actually a theorem proving engine but it's much more general compared to propositional logic. Because everything that we, do, that we did with propositional logic can be done using truth table. <clears throat> it's just going to be one gigantic truth table. You have 
what we consider as psi, which is everything in the iota set, and then you have phi, which is you know, a proposed you know, theorem. So you basically make a gigantic you know, truth table. As long as that implication is true for every single entry in the truth table, you have proven that phi is, in fact, a theorem of psi. But this, is, this goes one step further because it can, handle, um, uh, it can handle quantifiers, which means you can give it certain facts, which is equivalent to things that we have in, uh, in the set of iota. But you can also give it rules so they can actually derive things out of the facts. So it's a, it's a much more general system compared to propositional logic. So did I answer your question? OK, go ahead. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go ahead and make, we'll, we'll have fun with this, OK? We're going to have fun with this. Yep. No, it has basic understanding of math. So all the math you know, operators are understood. It also has the ability to handle lists. That's the only way it can handle things that, that are in the sequence, but it knows how to handle lists. Yep. So it has you know, some rather interesting intrinsic capabilities, but the most important part is it has the backtracking mechanism, which means it will explore all the available options in every single way to prove to try to prove something is true. And you, all you have to do is to, is to specify the rules, and it will apply the rules to its best capability to prove that something is true. And things that it cannot prove is true is then false. Okay, So can someone tell me a Jedi who does not own a lightsaber? Hmm? Doesn't Yoda, does, um, in the newer, in episode six, huh? The new, the new one? Okay, let's say she does not, okay, is a Jedi. So she is a Jedi, and how do you spell Rey? R-E-Y, okay, so, we'll, so Rey is a Jedi. So now we're gonna have some interesting thing, is, which is possession, okay? So now we have your know, um, facts that will say who has what. So we'll say Luke Skywalker has. Um, how do you how would you want to call his lightsaber? What is the what is the color of the uh, the beam? Green. green. Okay. So we'll say green green beam lightsaber. Okay. And how about Obi Wan Kenobi? What is the the color of his uh, the plasma? Is it blue? Okay. So Obi Wan has a blue beam saber. Okay. And now we have to say what is a GB saber and what is a BB saber. Okay. So we'll say is a light saber GB saber is a light saber BB saber. Okay, so all I'm doing right now is to you know just you know, state the facts. Okay, the facts are who are the Jedi's within this universe, who owns what, and what is that. Is that okay? So now I can define something a little bit more fun. Now we can say is a proper Jedi. <laughs> so this one is not a fact anymore. Okay, because I don't want to have to manually go through every single Jedi here and say, okay, who is a proper Jedi? I want to define what is a proper Jedi. So, so now I use a variable. Remember, uppercase is a variable, which means it's not, I'm not referring to a specific thing, but whatever goes into this particular spot has to satisfy everything else that I'm going to specify. So this time, it's not going to end with a period. This time, it's going to end, you know, it will be this thing here. Um, this is basically the reverse of implies. So typically, when we have a right arrow going from left to right, it is the left-hand side implies the right-hand side. This is the opposite, OK? The right-hand side implies the left-hand side. Or you can say this is 
is implied by. Okay, you can call this operator is implied by the following thing. So what following thing are we talking about? Well, first of all, I think it makes sense that x is a Jedi to begin with. Okay, and then we will the comma is used as an and. Okay, so when you separate these you know um, clauses by a comma, each one you know basically the comma is a is a conjunction, is an and. So now we say x has to be a Jedi first. Okay, and then we want to express that x owns a lightsaber. Okay. So how do we express that? Well, we have to say has, okay? X has to own something called Y, and then Y has to be a lightsaber. Is a lightsaber. Okay. All right, so let's just pause here and see if we understand what line 15 is trying to say. So we can read it forward. We can say X is a proper Jedi only if, or implied is implied by, X is a Jedi, we have to confirm that. X has to own something called Y, and that Y has to be a lightsaber. If all three conditions are satisfied, then we can call X a proper Jedi. Is that okay? So now we can have fun over on the query side again, because we can now ask you know, who is a proper Jedi. So now we say is a proper Jedi, and the first thing we can do is to just ask, is Obi-Wan a proper Jedi? Okay, so we do a control enter. It just comes back and say, yep, he's a proper Jedi because first of all, Obi-Wan is a Jedi. Obi-Wan owns a blue beam saber and the blue beam saber itself is a lightsaber. So we confirm all three things that are needed in order for uh, Obi-Wan to be a proper Jedi. Is that okay? Uh, I, I want to double check to make sure this is not bothering people who do not understand what I'm talking about. What is a Jedi? What is a lightsaber? Am I bothering anyone? I just want to be... What is an Obi-Wan? <laughs> ask, ask chat GPT. <laughs> who is Obi-Wan Kenobi? <clears throat> All right. So... But you can also flip the question, okay? So let's ask you know, who is not, okay? So we are asking, is Ray a proper Jedi? So according to the interpretation of people in this class, Ray is not a proper Jedi because she does not own a lightsaber. But you can also turn this thing here into a variable like X. Now you're asking, tell me all the proper Jedi within this universe according to these rules, okay? So that's kind of cool because now you can say it, it shows that Luke Skywalker can be a proper Jedi and then Obi-Wan can be a proper Jedi and then it will say false because you know, it's exhaustively trying to search for every single um, atom within this universe that can be a proper Jedi. So are we, yeah, go ahead. Huh? You can use Y, you can use anything you want. So you can use any name you know, as long as it starts with the uppercase. Okay, so you can say um, potential Jedi if you want to. I mean, use a longer name. So that works too, right? As long as it as long as it starts with the uppercase, you're good. All right. So are we still doing okay so far? Okay. Yes. Um, no, you cannot. Well, yes and no. Okay. So you cannot uh, create an. You cannot create a query. You cannot create a. You cannot create a predicate on the fly on this side in a query. So you have to whatever predicate you want to use has to be defined here. So right now you can ask questions like this. So you can ask, you know, who has what. So you can ask, you know, what does Luke Skywalker own in this universe? So Luke Skywalker. So you can ask questions like this. And it will come back and say, okay, we only got one thing. So if you want to, you know, um, enter into the facts that Luke Skywalker also owned the, 
the race car, the speeder thing. Um, he technically he made. Um, well, I guess he did not. Did he make a CPO three? CPO. Yeah. He did, right? Yeah. So if you want to enter, that is also something that he owns. You know, you can do that. So that, but later on, you know, in order to state what that is, then you have to say is a robot. Okay, CPO three and so on. So it's a very flexible system, as you can see. Okay. Um, any questions at this point? Because I think this is rather interesting. I mean, it beats a lot of the other topics that we talk about in this class, right? This is this looks like programming. It is programming, but it's not the kind of programming that you're used to. Yes. This is prologue. C++ is mm, uh, it's object oriented. Oh, yeah. It's all object oriented. Uh, this is I think it's called declarative. Let's check out. Okay, prolog declarative programming. There we go. Because all you're declaring, all you're doing is declaring truths and rules. You leave it up to the engine to figure out how to get to the truth value of a query that you're formulating. Hmm? <laughs> um, there are certain things that are difficult or tricky to do in Prolog, <clears throat> but we'll we'll get to those things too. But first of all, but we just want to kind of you know introduce Prolog like this. So are we are we good so far? Okay. <clears throat> so we go back to. This program here. So now you can start to enter like SIFs, okay? So is a SIF. Uh, we have CDS. CDS. Is that how you spell CDS? You know, as the SIF? Okay. Is a SIF. Um, who else is a mall? Okay. How do you spell mall? M A U L? M A U L. Okay. All right. So now we can, you know, we have you know, a few uh, SIFs here. So now we can define something like, you know, um, you can also declare which Jedi disagrees with which Sith. Okay. So I can now say this agrees with. So we'll say Obi Wan disagrees with. Oh, you, we are missing the most important one. My favorite. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you know, when it comes to Vader, this is something that I just did this morning. If you have not checked out this video, you should do it. Okay, let me see if I can. I don't want to play the music. Well, maybe it won't you know, cause an infringement problem. We'll give, it a, we'll give it a try. For us, there is no calm before the storm. That's when we get to work, putting what? systems in place to keep you connected. I can silence the mic on the recorder, but does it also do uh, copyright infringement based on the image? It's just sound? That's kind of lame. <laughs> 